my core philosophical view is that all truth is God's truth. And St. Paul says in Romans chapter 1 that the wicked suppress the truth and unrighteousness. But fortunately for them, it will often pop up, and sometimes at inconvenient moments, that they're made in the image of God. While they can actively try to suppress the truth, it's going to pop out. Welcome, gentlemen. My name's Paul Robson, and this is going to be an interview with Michael Hyatt. So Michael Hyatt is an author, podcaster, blogger, speaker, and CEO of Full Focus, one of the largest and fastest growing coaching companies in the US. He has authored 14 different books, many of them reaching worldwide bestseller lists. And in November, he's releasing the second edition of his best-selling book to date, Your Best Year Ever. And that's the topic of our um, interview today. There's another important thing about him, though, that Michael is also the, uh, a deacon in the Orthodox Church, in which I'm also a member. And so for me, he's been a really important part of my journey, actually. I've been following him for a very long time, um, especially coming into Orthodoxy as an entrepreneur and a business owner. There's not so many Orthodox saints who are the normal people we look to for examples of taking difficult decisions. Uh, then having a living example of other men who've kind of gone before you is a really, really important thing for me, I found. So especially that, that Michael Hyde has this really broad appeal to an incredibly wide audience, very far outside of the narrow little orthosphere, uh, and is you know seen broadly as a very, very important business leader in, in developing um, companies and, and business advice is a really relevant thing, an interesting thing for me to understand. How is he doing that and how can I be following suit? So talking about that is exactly what we get into towards the end of this podcast, as well as what he sees as our role as men uh, as we're going into these different times that we're having at the moment. So without further ado, here comes Michael Hyatt. Deacon Michael Hyatt, or should I just say Michael Hyatt, uh, welcome to the podcast and uh, thank you so much for agreeing to have a chat. Thank you, Paul. Looking forward to this conversation. Yeah. So you have a second edition of a book coming out called Your Best Year Yet. Uh, I've been sent an advanced copy and really had a good time reading it and going through it. Um, just finished it up actually on the flight back here from the United States yesterday. Uh, so, and I've, I've written down a whole lot of questions during the thing. So I'm going to go through the ones that I think are the most relevant and interesting and go through the chapters actually, and maybe give people a little bit of an overview of what to, what, what to expect okay. from the book. Um, so what, maybe I can start by asking though, what was the reason that you decided to, uh, to do another edition and to update it? Well, there's always, you know, my thinking is always evolving for starters. And there's things that I feel like, you know, I could probably express better, uh, new research available on goal achievement. And so I just wanted to keep it current and the book is sold, uh, very well. The book is, that's my best selling book. I think I've written 14 books now and it's my best selling book. So the publisher just came to me and said, Hey, how about if we do a new updated revised version? And I said, that sounds like a great idea. I've read free to focus and, um, uh, the one about visionary leadership, uh, yeah, which has really leader. influenced my work a lot. Uh, so I, we run a program here, here that, and especially online since COVID and a lot of it is based on your work. You'll recognize all of your ideas if you dive into oh, our training you. material. Um, thank you. So, it's real, yeah, privilege and pleasure to be able to talk through. And and I really enjoyed reading this one. Definitely, it seemed like um, just going through all of the basics uh, of, of really putting together a plan and executing on, on creating the best year yet of your life. So uh, I'm looking forward to talking about it. And I guess I'll be taking a bit more. Some of it will just be from like as looking at it from a self-help perspective. But uh, I'm also an Orthodox Christian. Uh, and I actually knew about you before I knew you were an Orthodox Christian as well. Um, but, but maybe we'll bring in a bit of that angle as well, looking from a kind of like entrepreneurial, uh, perspective on, on those kinds of ideas. Well, that'd be good because I, I really try to, to integrate my Orthodox faith into anything or everything I do. In fact, when I wrote the first edition of this book, um, I sent it to a couple seminary Orthodox seminary professors and asked them to review it and make sure that everything that I was writing about would be consistent with a Christian worldview. Mm -hmm. So that's really important to me. And, you know, I, I don't feel called in a business context to preach the gospel explicitly, but always implicitly and always, um, I always want to be congruent with the gospel. So that flows out of my world worldview. 
I've I've come to realize because having been a businessman for many years, not as a Christian, actually as an atheist, I've really realized like in able to really chart a course, you need to have a strong foundation. And when you ensure that your foundation is integrated with 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 your fundamental beliefs about reality, that's when you actually do meaningful work that you can look back on 10 years from now and, and appreciate, right? <laughs> so uh, well, absolutely. And, and I think we have to have an integrated worldview because I, I can't compartmentalize. It's not like I've got my you know life that's inside the temple and then my life that's outside the temple. And I have a different set of presuppositions for for each one of those spheres. No, it all it all works together. So the more integrated that I can make those, the easier it is, you know, for me to just be faithful to what God's called me to do. And I think to have a consistent message that resonates for people. Has that been difficult for you sometimes? Has it been hard priorities? And have you felt temptations to compromise or has it been fairly easy? It's been fairly easy. Yeah. You know, I mean, I've, I've been a Christian now for, I was converted at 18 and I'm 68. So I've been a Christian for a long period of time. I was a Protestant first, mm -hmm. but uh, I converted to Orthodox Christianity about 40 years ago. And so I've, you know, certainly I have tons to learn. I feel like I very I barely scratched the surface, mm -hmm. but, you know, like most Orthodox Christians, you know, I'm steeped in the life of the church. You know, I serve at the altar every week. Um, I have the privilege of being in a parish where we have uh, three priests and six deacons, believe it or not. Wow. Mm -hmm. And so, and most of us have served together for over 35 years. Mm -hmm. So it's it's just a good group. That sounds like a really strong community. Yeah. So I just, my little, we have a tiny monastery with one Orthodox nun on a tiny island. 25 minutes sailing from where I am. Um, and uh, we, yeah, we have visiting priests there. Uh, so I've just been over last week and visited Father Michael Butler. He lives in Livonia in Michigan and uh, massive church packed with 300 people, uh, three, four priests, uh, five deacons, 20 altar boys or something like that, all running wow. around with their candles and stuff like that. And I was just blown away. I mean, it was my first uh it was my first like big english language liturgy as well i've been to greece but i mean oh, it was amazing so quite an experience to see that living in the kind of desert of orthodoxy that that i'm in at the moment yeah um well, no. i don't know if this is worldwide but orthodoxy in north america and this is anecdotal um seems to be really growing yeah. you know i just i had a priest and his wife staying at my home for the last several days who was visiting from texas and in his parish in Austin, I think he told me he had over 20 catechumens right now. And it's not even great Lent, you know, when you would expect yeah. a lot of catechumens to be preparing themselves for holy baptism and holy chrismation. But um, but yeah, they're coming out of the woodwork. And our same thing's happening with our church. Our church, I think we have about 450 members. And on any given Sunday, about the size of that church in Michigan, Father Michael's church will have 300, 350 people. And Communion, even with five or six of us serving, still takes, you know, 20 minutes. <laughs> I can't imagine if it was one priest. <laughs> yeah, that'll be a long queue. Yeah. Okay, great. And I'm sure we could probably talk about orthodoxy in the church a long time, but let's let's dive into the book uh, and, and get into some okay. of the questions there that I, I think I had. And what I've, what I've done is, so there's six chapters, uh, and I've, I really loved, especially your intros to the chapters. I, I love the way that you kind of frame with stories a lot of the time and introduce some ideas and challenge some normal understandings and and then and then you bring in uh, some perspective so i thought i'd I'd, I'd take that so the chapters are your best year yet which is like the introduction then we have believe the possibility so first of all creating that be belief that things can change completing the past so turning back and dealing with all those things in the past then afterwards designing the future finally number five is find your what your why and then make it happen. Um, yeah, that's so that, that's, yeah, <laughs> that's the structure that we're going to have. Um, I, the most powerful image to the whole book was actually in this first chapter, Believe the Possibility. Um, and I actually want to, can I, I, I don't know, if, should I read it up? I can put it in the chat. Maybe sure. if I put it in the chat chat, can I get you to read it? Um, yeah, sure. The, the quote from the book that I was hoping to get in there. This is the quote. This is the study about the people walking in circles and in straight lines. Is that what you want me to read right there? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Participants were told to walk for hours in fields, the desert, and forests during various times of the day. 
If they could follow the sun or the moon, people tended to stay on a relatively straight path. But once clouds covered the sky, even if people thought they were going straight, their perception was fallible. Small, random errors bearded them off course. Over time, their own paths would cross and loop. The study concludes that people walk in circles due to increasing uncertainty about where straight ahead is. Our whole lives were asked to walk straight lines without a guide. If you're tired of going in circles, making little progress in life, the good news is that you can change your path. Your aspirations can serve as a compass to keep you moving in the right direction, especially if you take the extra step of turning them into explicit goals. But, and this is the essential point, only if you believe those goals can be realized. Beliefs are that powerful, and we'll discover why in the chapters ahead. So this was just so much the experience of my own life is that I didn't, I live most of my life without a clear goal, <laughs> or maybe I've had goals, but I haven't been very, very um, reflective about what those goals are. I kind of just took them yeah. out of the culture. And so as a result, if I look back, I've just been working, walking in circles <laughs> and, and going in loops. And so it was just so clear to me how it's such a good metaphor for the way we live our lives. Well, I think it is too. And I, I don't tell that this story I'm about to tell you in this book, I tell it in another book, mm -hmm. but years ago, this was probably now 35 years ago, maybe my wife and I went to Hawaii on a vacation. And at the time we were, we didn't have much money, so we couldn't do much in the way of entertainment, but at the hotel we were staying at, they were providing free snorkeling lessons. So we learned how to snorkel. Doesn't take much. The next morning we got up, we went out into this lagoon and we began paddling around and we were so mesmerized by everything that we were seeing under the water that we kind of lost track of where we were. The next thing I knew is I lifted my head out of the water and we'd been caught in a riptide and had been pulled out to sea. And I don't know how far away we were, but it seemed like a long, long way. And so my wife looked up at the same time she screamed. She said, what are we going to do? And I said, I don't know what to do other than to swim hard and try to get back to shore, which is what we did. And it took us about 45 minutes, maybe an hour. We got back. We were utterly exhausted. And we didn't go snorkeling for decades after that. Mm -hmm. But I think it it was, was, for me, a metaphor about what happens when you get distracted, preoccupied just by, you know, the interesting things of life and there's no plan. You know, you don't look up kind of like the example of the research uh, walking in circles. But the thing I I realized in that situation is nobody ever drifts to a destination they would have chosen. You know, you usually drift to bad places. And the alternative to that is to design your life. And, and frankly, I think this feel this fits perfectly with the Christian worldview, because we are stewards of what God has been given us, our lives. And we have to steward them well. And that means that, you know, we just can't can't sit back and be reactive, but we have to be proactive. We have to be thoughtful. We have to, you know, plan the future and design it to the best of our ability, obviously, always with it, um, with our hands open to God for our plans, knowing that they can change in a moment, but still having some design uh, to it. Yeah, Father Hans, Jacob C. actually puts us in a really beautiful way that shape my thinking on this because i grew up in a pentecostal church mm. and in the pentecostal church then everything has to be kind of like spontaneous it has to just yeah. be like kind of intuitive and it has to be out of right now and if there's too much structure or anything like that there was also no official leadership in our church as well they didn't believe in that everybody was equal as priests and while i can see that there are some things that can be quite beautiful in that spontaneity then what father hans says he says the thing that some, you know, this kind of approach is missing is that there's an order to creation. <laughs> the universe yes. has structure. God has created a structure. And so, and that structure goes out into all of the, the, you know, every little part of reality in some ways. And so as we see things clearly, we can start understanding that structure and we can become a part of that structure as well. And so I can really see, you know, my, me and my brother, we're very different people. My brother's always lived a kind of a life of uh, service. And and that's um he's he's it's a very beautiful thing in that he's not he's he has no selfishness in him, but he's also sometimes ended up serving something that's been really bad because he hasn't you know he's got into a relationship that hasn't been good for him but he hasn't been able to figure that out and so he's ended up in a pretty bad place before he's realized no I got to do something about this as well, and so I wonder if that's a part of that like 
in order to be able to orient properly, you need to know the landscape. You need to be able to see not just the details of the beautiful corals in front of you, but see the big picture, have an overview of the map. Uh, maybe talking about, you know, Paul Hansi talks about your cosmology and your anthropology, like knowing the way things fit together. Does that make sense? Yeah. Well, it's, you know, it's like in the creation account, it's not that God is randomly creating, just kind of throwing this out and throwing that out and hope it all fits together. It's clear that he's building with a design in mind. You know, there's a, there's an end goal. And Dr. Stephen Covey always said, begin with the end in mind. And I think that's exactly right. You know, you, you've got to, first of all, envision what it is that you're trying to create. And that's the first part of the book. Uh, envision what it is that, that you want to create or what you want to do. And then kind of uh, deconstruct it from there or reverse engineer it mm -hmm. so that you can say, okay, how can I create or make that vision a reality? And this is part of, I think, what it means to be made in the image of God is we have the privilege of co-laboring or collaborating with God in bringing about his will on earth, always as his servants, but also as partners with him in co-creating or creating what he's doing in the world. So one could say, because I mean, the, the, the core objection is always like, you know, we should be saying thy will not be done, not my will. But actually when Christ said that, he knew what he needed to do, right? He, right. he said thy will be done, but he knew what was going to happen. And so I think if we're anchored in the right place, then we can also create a vision of where we want to go and be saying thy will be done in the creation of my vision, something like that. Does that make Absolutely. sense? Absolutely. You know, these, I think sometimes these are often pitted against one another. Yeah. You know, either we're submitting to the will of God or we're planning our way and we can't do both. And I think it's both and, but we have to plan in the right way. You know, we have to plan uh, prayerfully uh, with our plans open before the Lord with Certainly, he has the permission to change those plans at any point along our journey. But um, I recently, about two weeks ago, I was celebrating the anniversary of a heart attack that I had a year ago. Mm -hmm. And it kind of came out of nowhere because um, I really take good care of myself. I eat well. I exercise. I have for decades. But there was a genetic issue. And long story short, I went back on the anniversary of this heart attack where I had a subsequent surgery and I was reading my journal. And that very morning when I had the heart attack, I had all these plans laid out, you know, all these things I wanted to do, but God had a different plan. And my plan had to yield to his plan. And even when it happened, you know, when I was in the ambulance going to the hospital, I had tremendous peace about it. But I think we just have to be in a place where we're willing for our plans to be interrupted at any moment based on what, you know, God, how God may be leading us. Um, even this week, my daughter was about to take off for Egypt. It's a plan that she'd been, um, it had been in motion for a month. She was going to some friends to Egypt to visit the pyramids and see all the sites and do all that thing. But of course, you know, we had this most, we've had this most recent conflict between the Israelis and the Palestinians break out over the weekend. And I, I decided to call her on Monday. I just felt this urge to call her and just say, I, I really don't think you should go. I mean, you're an adult, do whatever you want. But I just feel impressed to call you and tell you, I don't think you should go. And to her credit, she thought about it. And she was at the gate about to board. Oh, oh. And she decided not to go. Mm -hmm. But I think that's what it means to hold our plans open. You know, be, be diligent, be thoughtful, plan but always with the the realization that God could tap you on the shoulder at any moment and interrupt those plans with his plan. And that's fine. Mm -hmm. Not always easy to do, but, uh, and, and having the right people in your life that can do those little prods as well. Right. I think that's yes. uh, probably a, a challenge for, for at least me as well. Yeah. Very important. Yeah. I, maybe we, we, you get to that in the book, but may, maybe how does one make sure you have the right people that are, and have the right structures for them to be able to do that? Is that, yeah, well, I do. I do get into this in the last part of the book where I talk about you know the whole process of making it happen and yeah. executing against your plan. You know, life should be a team sport. If there's one thing uh, we should know as Orthodox Christians is that that that's the case. We don't exist as individuals by ourselves, practicing our faith alone, but we exist inside of a community. But I think the next level beyond that is I get to choose who my friends are going to be. There's this famous 
saying by uh, Jim Rohn, a U.S. author who wrote on self-help a lot, but he said, you're the average of the five people you spend the most time with. Yeah. And, you know, I don't know if you could empirically verify that or not, but just uh, it, it does feel it does feel anecdotally true. And so I think to be thoughtful about our friendships, for example, you know, if I surround myself with too many negative people or people that are interested in in things that I don't feel like are that worthwhile, sooner or later, I'm going to pick up their habits. I mean, it's just it's just inevitable. You're going to create a small group culture and, every you know, some people are going to sink to the level of culture. Some people will rise to the level of the culture. But I think it's important that that we choose our friends. Uh, Ecclesiastes, I love this passage of scripture. I think it's in chapter four. It says two are better than one because they have a good return for their labor. For if either of them falls, the one will pick up his fellow. But woe to the one who falls when he is alone. And so um, having the right people involved with us can really help us to achieve more and also correct us when we get off path or when God wants to interrupt our, our plan with his will. One of the topics that came up in this retreat that we just had, and it was an Orthodox Christian <laughs> retreat for men, uh, was how do we consider and work with friendships in uh, with fellow Orthodox Christians, with maybe people of other denominations, and then even people who aren't Christians as well? Um, there was a John Chrysostom text called On Brotherhood, which strive, he, he wrote a lot about like, you know, the, the striving of really having deep love between your Christian brothers. And then there was a distinction. He said, strive to live peaceably with all, all men when talking about people outside mm -hmm. the church as well. Do you have kind of any principles or thumb rules of how you, how you handle relationships with non-Christians or, or people yeah, outside of orthodoxy? Yeah. You know, I think that um, we're called to be in the world, but not of the world. So I think what that means at a practical level is that uh, we just can't withdraw ourselves from the world and only have friendships with Orthodox Christians mm -hmm. because God is on a mission uh, of redemption and we're required to go and make disciples of all nations. And that means we are we have to be having intentional interaction with non-Christians. Mm -hmm. And so I don't resent that or try to diminish it in my life. You know, I welcome it. And so much of that is an opportunity to have a conversation with somebody, offer a different point of view, love them well, look for an opportunity to share with them the full gospel of Jesus Christ. And so, yeah, so I want to mix. You know, I've I've got people that I go to church with or people that I'm on an Orthodox board with, and, you know, all that's important, but also my relationships in the world with my neighbors who may or may not be Christians, that's important too. Absolutely. And I, 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 we, one of the things that just strikes me is that everybody I know who's become Orthodox or even just becomes Christian, it's always through a personal relationship. It's very seldom always. just from, uh, you know, sometimes can be re re read a book and be inspired, but it is through that, the personal reception of love from another human being. I think that's where, that's what actually happens. And, and so that's our primary thing, not just our ability to whack people in the head with our moral arguments or whatever it is, or yeah. political issues or something like that. Well, I yeah. used to be that way when I was young. You know, I used to think I could argue people into the kingdom. Yeah. And uh, it, it doesn't work that well. I mean, there's a place for that. There's a place for apologetics. There's a place for being clear in the way that you articulate the faith. But if the foundation of that, the context of that is not a loving relationship, it makes it more difficult for the other person to hear it. Yeah. And so I think that's why <laughs> word and deeds go hand in hand. You know, it's not as though preach the gospel or, you know, do acts of service. It's both. And, yep. you know, like so many things in Orthodox are, I mean, we, we are the, um, we're the Christians of both. And. Yeah. So doesn't this take on an extra level of difficulty though, when you're working like, so I'm also working with in a coaching business where we're often dealing with questions of values and the, especially the foundational values for people's lives um, mm -hmm. and it, I find it sometimes challenging. I notice that fellow Christians just, sh we have this, I can, I can rest in knowing that we have this shared foundation. <laughs> um, and with, with other people, I just, I'm not sure, <laughs> I'm not sure where they are yeah. in the long term, right? Because there can be gaps. Uh, a lot of people have, you know, almost everyone's values are formed through Christianity, but how, how does that play out in your work, especially in a kind of value-based work that you have? Well, 
certainly if if you know the other person is a Christian, that there are likely going to be some shared values, mm. but not always. Yeah. <laughs> That's also true. <laughs> you know, um, yeah. you know, I can think of a couple of clients that I have that aren't Christians, but are more Christian than some of my Christian friends. Yeah. You know, in terms of how they treat other people and all that. I mean, you know, and it's not, it's it's not a substitute for Christianity, but but I find that if I just approach each person as an individual and really get to know them and find out where their priorities are and where their values are, you know, rather than just assuming, because it's easy to assume, mm -hmm. but uh, you really can't do that, especially anymore, because there is so much diversity, even in the Orthodox Church. You know, when I first became Orthodox, you know, 40 years ago or so, um, you know, pretty much all Orthodox Christians held the same things in common, but I think this is a little bit where the culture's impacted us too, so that you've got, sadly, more liberal Orthodox Christians, more extremely conservative Orthodox Christians, and there's a vast array of perspectives. And so I think it's just always good to, to ask the question where they're at and not make assumptions. It could also be that being a Christian, it's more about the trajectory of where you're intending to head, but yes. it doesn't say anything about where you are. And right. Christianity is often for the sick and the hurt and the, the the ones in pain, I guess, like I was when I started with it as well. So it doesn't mean that you're perfect yet, even if you're, uh, or that you're you know, without traumas. Okay. I'm going to have to move on to the second uh, chapter before we get caught sure. up too much. Um, and completing the past. Um uh, and the introduction of the chapter was really about like this thing of like carrying your baggage around with you, the way that we allow that to limit our beliefs, limit our understanding by these stories that we have. Um, I actually would like to just share a story with you uh, here uh, and with maybe with the listeners shortly about a really big piece of baggage that I carried with me for a very mm. long time in my life. Um, so it was my very first girlfriend uh, growing up in a town out in the desert in South Africa. Um, then I had sorry someone's just calling me here um then someone uh yeah i there was one beautiful girl in my church who i of course fell in love with my brother also fell in love with her um but i i was the one who got her and for various reasons that relationship went sour uh, and i got very hurt from that relationship and so for a very long time i was angry with this this woman this girl and this woman and I would often tell the story of our relationship and I would always make sure I told it in a way where she looked like a terrible, terrible person. And then after many years and many wanderings in my life and especially problems and drama and trouble with women, it's been the, the real, my real weakness throughout my entire life and all of the mistakes and also my decision to leave Christianity far behind. I was an atheist for many, probably for most of my adult mm. life. Then I came back to Christ through some miraculous things happening. And then I was, I decided to go stay at a Bible college for a little while. And a part of being at this Bible college, everyone had to tell the story of their life. And I realized that this was an important thing that I needed to tell. And I realized that I'd been telling, putting the blame on her the whole time. And so I told the story in a way that I took the blame on myself. So I, I blamed myself for what happened. And the, I walked out of that meeting. I'm like, oh, I need to go for a run now. And just before I went for my run, I picked up my phone and looked at my phone. I haven't heard from this girl for over 20 years. And she had just sent a message to me like five minutes as after I got outside of that, of that hall and told that. Wow. She just sent me a message. And then we had a conversation and we cleaned, every, cleaned everything up. And it was like this burden was released from me. And three months later, I proposed to my, not to her, but to my, to another woman and got married and had a child on our way. Or yeah, she conceived a child. We, we, yeah, she got pregnant on our, on our wedding night. So everything just, the whole of my life fell into place when it came to women by leaving that baggage behind. Yeah. So. Yeah. It's so important because yeah. uh, I, I think most people drag the past along with them as though it's baggage they can't get rid of. And uh, there's a writer that uh, once said, your life is going to either be shaped by a memory of the past or a vision of the future. Mm -hmm. And the problem with a memory of the past, and certainly, you know, is, Orthodox Christians, um, we do want to remember. I mean, in, in a sense, the the Eucharist is a great remembering. You know, we remember uh, the, the life and the work of our Savior and all of that. But 
that's not to say every memory is equally productive. And the the book I, I wrote just before this one, it just came out earlier this year, is called Mind Your Mindset. And it's all about sort of the neuroscience of our mindset, how we think and how our thinking influences our actions and our actions uh, contribute to our results. And so there's always what happened, like in your particular case, you know, you had this breakup with this girlfriend, and then there's the meaning that we assign to it. And those are two different things. And it, and there's one of the things that we know from neuroscience is that um, that a lot of our memories, in fact, the bulk of our memories, up to 70% of our memories, are distorted in some significant way. And maybe as much as 20 to 25% of our memories are false memories. We remember things that didn't actually happen. Wow. And so we have to be careful with those memories, that they're not shaping our present. Some memories can really serve us. And certainly if we can distill from uh, difficult experiences, if we can distill the wisdom out of that and use it to move forward in the future, great. But we don't want to be dragging the worst of our past into the best of our future, because essentially it, it colors us and limits us in terms of what we can accomplish and what we can, can do and the, the impact that we can have in the world. Mm -hmm. That's amazing. So you're saying that when me and my wife just remember something completely differently, there's actually reason to be skeptical of my own memory. <laughs> 25%. <laughs> well, it's true. And it, and it actually doesn't take long to happen because when we, when we come to any experience, you know, something happens and then we almost immediately begin to construct a story about that. And that I talk about that in, mind your mindset that we have this character that lives in our brain. I call him the narrator. And it's just this incessant voice that's constantly telling us what that means. And the purpose of that voice is to keep us safe. And so it's always going to be self-protective and it's always going to construe the story in our favor, but, um, but it's all designed to keep us safe, but it's just not always accurate. In fact, it's rarely accurate. And so we have to interrogate those stories and get them resolved. And I'm not just saying we can sweep them under the rug. And and certainly what I talk about in your best year ever um, it would not be applicable to somebody that had serious trauma. Mm -hmm. You know, in that particular situation, probably some good counseling or therapy would be great. But for the ordinary baggage that most of us carry around, there's a whole process that I outline in the book to resolve that past so that we can can be done with it. And so that we can move on, like you were talking about, and and you know experience the abundant life that christ promised us absolutely yeah. uh, it's fascinating um and it, it almost seems like yeah it, like things leave we allow these things to leave hooks in us and it, it's it's kind of like a, in, a, in a metaphorical in a abstract sense it can sound far out and fluffy but but it's very very much my experiences that we we don't notice this but we we were formed by these these uh by our stories about the past and and so changing those stories uh can be very very powerful yeah good so the next chapter design the future that was perhaps the next most uh powerful image that i was impressed by you had this example of the biltmore estate this beautiful mansion that was built with a clear intention and plan uh put a lot of you know famous architects and and they were and it's like the center for our you know learning and growth and understanding and beauty um and then you contrast that with what's called the winchester mystery house uh which is this totally random crazy building that a crazy woman tormented by spirits <laughs> was uh, just building compulsively almost and just adding and adding and adding more. There's no plan or no design or no anything like that. Um, and so as I was reading that, I was wondering like, what what do we do if like most of us suddenly realize we turn 35 years old and we realize like, I'm living in a Winchester mystery house. <laughs> like <laughs> I've already built this thing. I can't just knock the whole thing down. Um, but I also like, can see it's not very healthy for me living here anymore so i need to start the process right. of moving but it's not it's not something you could do straight away um no i think i think that's part of what god's about in the world is bringing order out of chaos mm -hmm. and i think that when things devolve or descend into chaos that's kind of the work of the enemy mm -hmm. and and so uh many people in our world have very chaotic lives they're They've just, they've drifted to those destinations they wouldn't have chosen. And I, the, the good news is we can begin to design our lives 
uh, with a better intent. And I think, you know, that that's where we have to get in touch with what it is that we want. And I find that this is difficult, even for Christians. Uh, when I ask them the question, well, what do you want? What do you want for your health? What do you want for your marriage? What do you want for your kids? What do you want for your career? Very difficult to articulate that for a lot of people. And I give a whole process in the book for doing that. But even three times in the gospel, mm -hmm. Jesus shows up and somebody asks him to do something. And he says, well, what do you want me to do? Now, he's the son of God. Did he know? I mean, we have a theological discussion about this. Did he know what they wanted? I don't think he was asking for information. I think it was a rhetorical question to get them to become clear on what they wanted. Clarity accelerates progress. And when we're uncertain, when we're unclear, we get bogged down and we get stuck. And so the more clear we can be, uh, the faster we're going to make progress. And even if we're clear about the wrong destination, you know, it's it's. I sometimes have told people, I said, it's very difficult to steer a parked car. But if something's in motion, you can steer it, you can adjust, you can alter the course. But you got to get in motion. And that takes some clarity about the destination. Yeah, yeah you, you're just as honest as you can with yourself about what you really want. You have to think as deeply as you can about it. For me, I've had to accept like, I'm probably not <laughs> getting to the very deepest level of what I really want. I was just reading Alexander Schmemann today who has this passage where he says, um, all desire is ultimately a desire for God. That's what we really mm -hmm. want. <laughs> we want to be united with him. If you believe just, you know, even if you're not a Christian, if you believe this idea that, you know, like things happen for a reason, that's, you know, so so as you say, like we, we might be in chaos, but but things want to go towards that thing. And so when we start moving in what we think, you know, aiming for the best star we can see, then I guess then, uh, um, yeah, then we can start course adjusting, but get it going. I, I, I think so. And I think, I think we have to pay attention to what we desire. And I'm not talking about the purient, immoral desires that, that we have from time to time that we have to confess. But what do we really want? And I think that God has planted in each of us a desire that corresponds with our purpose. You know, and some people, you know, have a, have a desire to build things. Some people have a desire to paint or to compose music or to help people you know, or to free people from child trafficking or whatever it may be. But I think it's important that we pay attention to that. It's not, it doesn't just randomly appear. Those things are planted, I believe, in our hearts by God. And they're they're kind of a map to buried treasure if we pay attention to them. And I, and again, I think that all has to be done in the context of a community and, you know, needs to be in, in consultation with your priest and all the rest. But don't ignore it. And there, there are some Christians that have this attitude that, you know, if I if I actually really want it, then God couldn't be for it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, because God's, you know, they have this warped view that God's out to make their life miserable. Yeah. And so if they want it, if they desire it, it can't possibly be from God, because what God wants is for you just to suffer and be miserable. And, and certainly God can redeem any of that. But I don't think it's a very healthy perspective for most of us in moving through our lives. Yeah, certainly also, I mean, before I was a Christian, it's a very, very clear perception. It's like, oh, I can't become a Christian because then I'll have to give up on everything that I really desire and enjoy right. and love, you know, alcohol and sex and all these kinds of things. And then what you find is that actually, no, I've actually just lived a life of slavery to very yes. low things. And and actually, the this was a this was an opportunity to receive the power and support to be able to not be enslaved to these things. I still can drink beer. I still have sex with my wife, far more meaningful and deep than yeah. you know, what I would otherwise. So all of these things, I can have them, but I just have them much more fully uh, through God than, than when I'm trying to do it, getting my own way. So, yeah. Well, and all those things too, I think, you know, point to God. Yeah. And I think that when we pursue those lesser desires, those mo more base desires, you know, it's we're making an idol out of something that was, was intended like sex. Sex can be a very good thing, a very positive thing. There's the whole sacramental aspect to it. But um, we've got to make sure that all of this is done, you know, under the Lordship of Christ and in service to him. But as you say, getting moving is better. So on Manifesto Core, we have these network of online groups for men. One of the guys came in there and his first vision, it was that he could get laid by with as many women as possible. 
And so we said to him, well, that sounds like a bit of a selfish goal, but you decide your goals, dude. <laughs> so we, we're not going to approve that one, but, but, you know, try the process and see what happens. And so he, he was, he's, he's a 20 year old guy, right? Lives in Sweden. So he hooked up with one girl and was like, oh my gosh, this is so empty and meaningless yeah. and, and totally. So then he said, okay, well, instead he's going to try and set a goal to pray every day once a week for, or so, yeah, sorry, every day for, for, for a certain period of time. He's going to try praying every day. And eventually he found himself praying. He was saying, God, spirit, universe, whatever you are, please show me that Jesus is not God. That's what he was praying for. <laughs> <laughs> and then eventually he kept on giving this answer, Jesus is God, Jesus is God. <laughs> and then he just was like, okay, oh, I have to surrender. And since then his whole life has changed around. And now he has a fantastic vision and all kinds of beautiful things. But he needed to go through that first step of setting that bad vision, right. getting the car started, making a plan, moving towards it. and then Get in motion. He, yeah, got in motion. Yeah, that's a good. <laughs> okay, uh, great. One question from the book that I, I was wondering a little bit about um, uh, that uh, in this goal setting thing was that you change the SMART goals. Uh, so I use the SMART uh, acronym as well, but uh, instead of smarter. But but you also instead of saying realistic goals, you say risky goals. Um, and so my main experience is that I have guys coming in. And they're way over ambitious. They change a whole lot of stuff in a very short time. And then they collapse. Mm -hmm. And then it can be hard to get them going again sometimes. And so I've been going much more on the realistic than the, the risky, actually. Um, and so I've been trying to figure out, like... Well, how here's how I think of it. Yeah. And I talk about it in the book. <laughs> um, where you set your goal is important, based on the best goal achievement science. Mm -hmm. So if we set our goal inside the comfort zone, mm -hmm. um, a goal that doesn't really stretch us, a goal that doesn't really challenge us or require much of us, a realistic goal, all the science, all the goal achievement science says that you're less likely to achieve it. It just doesn't inspire you. It doesn't uh, command your focus. It doesn't motivate your best action. It just kind of lays there. And so people that set realistic goals in the comfort zone are less likely to achieve them than people who set their goals in the discomfort zone. Now, you got to be careful here because I'm not talking about the delusional zone. So that would be zone three. Zone one, comfort zone. Zone two, discomfort zone. Zone three, delusional zone. So this is more art than science, but you've got to dial it up to where you begin to feel a little bit uncomfortable. And so I look for three indicators of discomfort. I'm looking for a little bit of fear, a little bit of uncertainty, a little bit of doubt. You know, the fear is that, you know what? There's something at stake here. I may actually fail. I may not achieve this goal. That's going to make me focus on what I can do to actually achieve it. That's going to command my attention. It's going to require focus. I'm going to have to execute. Then the uncertainty. You know, when a goal's in the, the discomfort zone, a lot of times we're just not certain how to achieve it. And that's perfect. That's exactly what you want because that's going to stimulate your curiosity. That's going to get your, your full self engaged in trying to figure out how to get from where you are to where you want to be. And so uncertainty is something that a lot of people are, are uncomfortable with, but it's actually an indicator that we're on the right path. And then doubt. And this is what like one of the most prevalent, prevalent ones I see, Paul, where, where people just have a lot of self-doubt. You know, do I do I really have what's required to achieve this goal? Do I have what it takes? Mm -hmm. And when you feel those emotions, that's where when your goal is set where it should be. Now, again, I'm not talking about the delusional zone where you feel terror and total confusion and you know, you're just so down on yourself. No, that's counterproductive. But right there in the discomfort zone is what the goal achievement science says. That's where, where it's best to set your goals. And that's why instead of in that SMART acronym, the R for me stands for risky, not realistic. Make it a little bit risky. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, definitely. Yeah. Yeah. That's it. That's good to consider as well. Yeah. Uh, I, I've definitely done a lot through reaching for realistic goals. And then sometimes I've also fallen far short. So I don't know. Yeah. Um, I guess some of us have more arrogance about what we're able to achieve as well uh, in some ways uh, or unrealistic fantasies about what it is that I can do in, in a short period of time. So it, it can be, it can be difficult. I, th 
I, I think a lot of times people set goals that are realistic really because they're afraid. You know, they're just, they don't want to take a risk. Mm -hmm. They want to play it safe. But I'm going to tell you, I mean, nothing great ever happened in the world by somebody trying to play it safe. Yeah. You know? The way I normally explain it is like you're making a small course trajectory change, like a, a shift in your trajectory that over the long term is going to make a very big difference. So we're kind sure. of in it for the long term. And because what I normally find is that in the short term, people have way too small goals. Uh, sorry, way too big goals in the short term. And in the long term, they're they're under ambitious. So no I'm question. a big fan of like really big goals in the long term. And then like in a three month period, even sometimes guys want to, you know, do all, a whole lot of stuff in a very, very short period of time. And they get this overload thing. So that's why I think they, but yeah, I, I completely agree. Like get into the discomfort zone. Um, it's just, that's different for, for different people, I guess. Okay. It is. And that's, that's why I said it's art, not yeah. science. And I do differentiate in that that chapter between achievement goals and habit goals. Yeah. So achievement goals are sort of those big goals, like I'm going to write a book, you know, this year, or I'm going to take a, you know, a one month sabbatical and travel to another country, or I'm going to get married this year, or I'm going to have a kid this year, or I'm going to start a business this year, or whatever it is, you know, that's an achievement goal. Uh, and those tend to be bigger, they tend to be longer term, but a habit goal, and I, I really believe we are the sum total of our habits. You know, what you do on a consistent basis is who you are. And so those are, are typically what you're talking about, Paul, those small incremental changes where we're just changing our practice and our behaviors. And it doesn't really amount to much in the moment. But over time, it can totally change the trajectory of our lives and create a big outcome. And some of these habits are often you know, self-sabotaging dysfunctional habits, which we're addicted right. to. And so changing those is painful and difficult uh, and shouldn't be done all of them at the same time, perhaps, you know, uh, but but need to, um, you need to be often aware of like, okay, you know, there can be a tendency to replace it with something else uh, or something like that. But yeah, you, you also mentioned in the book like that, you know, this isn't for people who are seriously traumatized or something like that. Or, you know, if you need therapy, that can be- Right. Better. Right. So, and sometimes yeah. people have to grow in their risk tolerance. Mm -hmm. You know, what, what would be in my discomfort zone uh, may be, you know, in somebody else's delusional zone. Yeah. And I think that it's like everything else, the more you do it, uh, the more facility or the more uh, capacity you're going to get around it. And you have the confidence then to take on bigger goals. Bigger goals. And so, you know, again, it's just, it's really important. I, I think set a realistic goal. And then dial it up a click or two and put it in the discomfort zone, but don't go crazy. Yeah. Yeah. I can't help but wonder, maybe I last thing is I wonder, I, I work probably with a slightly different segment. I think my offerings are cheaper than yours. And so what I find is some people, they live in like these really big fantasies about what they want. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and they never start moving towards these things, but they're like, you know, someday everything's going to be completely different but they're very unrealistic fantasies and they're, they're scared to go into that thing. And so when you ask them for what their goal is, then they'll often bring up this very delusional thing. So that that's, that's maybe what it is that I'm um, thinking of. Okay. Yeah, that's where you have to chunk it down yeah. and create milestones or goals. You know, I, I wrote an entire book on life planning called living forward. And that's more the big 25 year look at what you want your life to be. But that's got to be broken down or chunked down. So what are my annual goals? You know, maybe I'm trying to repair a marriage that's really in trouble. And, um, you know, maybe that can't be done in a year. But what's what's the progress that I could make in this year to move me along in the trajectory of restoring my marriage and even going to another level? Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Okay, great. So the next... The next chapter we're on chapter four uh, is finding your why. Um, and the the thing that you you wrote this something about mimetic desire in there, but what, what I've noticed a lot is that people kind of have a hard time finding this personal why. <laughs> so they it, a lot of the words that are used uh, these days are kind of watered down. And so they have a hard time with this kind of idealistic language. And um, what most normally happens is then they'll just take whatever it is that's been spoken about in the culture. And so, like, you know, I'm sure there are people who really are personally connected to and work very engaged with climate change and, and uh, and you know, environmental sustainability. But I did that myself for eight years. I worked for Microsoft, actually, with environmental sustainability. 
And when I look back on it, I basically just took the thing that everybody else was talking about and seemed to be mm. the most important from what everybody else thought. And said, so I'm going to do that because it's a really good way for me to earn money, to get attention, to get approval, to have a good elevator speech and, and to, to be, you know, to be a relevant person or something like that. So it wasn't coming from a sense of, of my internal sense of purpose at all. Um, and so I wonder how does one start that process actually uh, of finding that internal why? Yeah, well, it, you're, you're asking a great question because there is a fundamental difference between extrinsic or external motiva motivation and intrinsic or internal motivation. And so a lot of people, they set their goals based on some kind of extrinsic motivation. You know, my spouse wants me to do this or my employer wants me to do this or my doctor wants me to do this. And the problem with those is that those kind of motivations aren't typically sustainable. Because in the pursuit of any goal, you're going to ultimately hit what I call in the book, the messy middle, mm -hmm. where you seem to lose lose motivation and everything seems harder than it was, you know, when you when you start, like I've, I've run a number of half marathons. And always when you're on the starting line, you know, and the last one I ran was like 30,000 people, you know, it was everybody was just like full of energy, full of motivation, you know, it was, it was contagious. But then you fast forward to like mile 10. And people are are wanting to drop out of the race, including me, because you're like, why? Did, what was I thinking? Why am I doing this? And so, you know, the two times when you're excited in a race that, that is that long is at the beginning, at the end, but there's that messy middle part where you want to quit. And it's only intrinsic motivation that will sustain you in that moment. And so I think to ask yourself the question, why is this important to me? What's at stake here? Why is it important that I get in good health or I maintain good health? Why is it important for me, not for anybody else? Why is it important to me? Why is my marriage important to me? And I think the more that you can make that intrinsic and really connect intellectually and emotionally with your why, uh, the better off you'll be. My wife often says people lose their way when they lose their why. And, and so to stay connected with the why, you think of the story in the book of Genesis with Esau and Jacob. You know, Esau basically sells his entire birthright mm -hmm. for, you know, a, a cup of cereal, for, a, you know, a cup of porridge. Mm -hmm. And it's he lost his why. You know, he wasn't connected to why his birthright was important. Therefore, he devalued it, and he was willing to compromise it when push came to shove. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. And there you also underline really the importance of relationships and, and having people around you to be able to to do that. that. That was what we spoke about earlier as well. And I thought that was also a great time to plug into that. It's like when you're around other people that also know their why, right? Then uh, it really, it helps. So some of the things you wrote there well, were really good. And occasionally we need somebody, a good friend or a spouse or a family member um, or pastor, you know, it could be anybody that gently takes us by the hand Mm -hmm. and leads us back to our why, yeah. you know, helps us remember in those moments when we're likely to forget. And this is a huge problem in the Bible, yeah. forgetfulness. Mm -hmm. And and God says over and over again, remember, you know, that's, that's a healthy view of the past. You know, remember the blessings of God, uh, the works of God, the acts of God, the, the person of God, you know, remember those things. And you know, we don't have to be exhorted to forget. That happens naturally. But we do have to be exhorted to remember. Especially in an age where we're so distracted. There's, totally. only, there's something almost divine, revelatory about remembering, the act of remembering, and it's yeah. getting harder and harder uh, these days. Things are things are happening faster. Um, okay, so the next one we have is make it happen. Um, and actually before, I mean, so, yeah, so the example that you had is a General McClellan from, I think it was from the American Civil War. Uh, I don't, I'm a European, so I don't know the, all the persons, but, but I really recognize the type <laughs> of person. I'm actually yeah. a Danish home guard as well. And, and you can really see that how some people have this decisiveness of action, what's needed. And it maybe becomes the most clear in, in war as well. There's actually, a, yeah. So making stuff happen. I actually want, I never, I, 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 I'm not sure about this. I want to ask you, are you the man who made this happen? Uh, uh, I actually am. Yeah. You I are. Was... Yeah. This I is was, an amazing thing. <laughs> I was the CEO of uh, Thomas Nelson Publishers. Yeah, okay. I happened to have National. it on my desk, but I was thinking, yeah. as I say, you're like, you made this happen, didn't you? <laughs> well, I, I didn't personally make it happen, yeah. but I was involved in the project. Yeah. I was the publisher. Yeah, yeah. 
where did that idea come from? Can I ask you that? It's like, because it's such a big and important thing in the English language, I would say. This is an Orthodox study Bible with amazing notes that I think has brought a depth of understanding of the Orthodox faith to the West that just hasn't existed before. Um, well, when I was when I was the CEO of Thomas Nelson Publishers, which, by the way, is the largest Bible publisher in the world, mm -hmm. um, we published lots of different kinds of Bibles, lots of English translations, Spanish translations. And one whole category of Bible that we published was a study Bible where notes about the text occurred with the text, making it very convenient yeah. to help people understand what they're reading. So we got the idea. My godfather, um, Father Peter Gilquist, a blessed memory. Oh, okay. Uh, also, the guy who for, converted with his whole church, right? Right. But, yeah, yeah, yeah. He worked for me at Thomas Nelson. He was one of our editors. Wow. And so um, he and I were involved in in that project, and he, along with the faculty at Saint Athanasius Academy, put together a group to write those notes. And it was a it, the project probably took a decade. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a, um, a big, big job. <laughs> <laughs> it's a it's a really big project and you know yeah. there's it's not perfect no. but but it's really really helpful and i I've, I've had so many people that it's really steered them in their faith and helped them to understand the scriptures from an orthodox perspective in a way that they they couldn't previously yeah uh, for me the the psalms the commentary on the psalms i've i've never understood the psalms properly i've always read them being like what like you want to bathe in someone's blood like what is this about and then when i read the every single psalm first i, I read it aloud i read the notes and then i read it aloud again and then everything made sense <laughs> like mm, everything you know? good. No, i just love reading the psalms before that i was just like it was like a confusing experience for me so that, that was ex especially that uh, gave me so much so yeah, that that's something. Okay, so yeah, decisiveness in action. Um, if we go back to back to that idea, um, yeah, yeah, um, yeah. It's it, I I think for a lot of people, they think it's enough to articulate what they want. There was a big book about twenty years ago called The Secret, mm -hmm. and it was all about the law of attraction. Yeah. And the idea was that you know if you just think really hard about what you want. The universe will bring it to your doorstep. And um, I don't, I, I, I wish it worked that way, but in my experience, it doesn't work that way. You know, you actually have to get to work. You know, you have a vision of it. I've been reading in uh, Nehemiah, of all things, from the Old Testament. And, you know, he had this great desire, Nehemiah did, to uh, rebuild the walls of Jer Jerusalem. And so he got permission from the king and uh, Babylon or Assyria had to go and do that. But it wasn't enough just to have that vision of what would it be like to have a rebuilt Jerusalem. He had to roll up his sleeves, recruit other people, and get to work. And for our dreams, for our goals, that takes real work. It takes real progress. It, it needs to start with a dream, needs to start with a goal, but it can't end with that. That's what they call um, in philosophy a uh, necessary but insufficient situation yeah. when i think of him as well then i think like he was a man who really knew who he was and he had a very strong identity as a part of a people and he saw the thing that needed to be done that would be the most meaningful and so thinking of myself and many of the other young men coming into the orthodox faith at the moment then a lot of us are coming because of a concern about where the mainstream is going mainstream culture mm -hmm. So we're seeing politics getting increasingly crazy, polarized, dysfunctional in many, many yeah. ways. We're seeing a, a massive spike in mistrust of media, mistrust of institutions, mistrust of, of just the general culture. And so when I read your books, then it's unique somehow in the contemporary authors that I read and that it's still really drawing on all the goodness in our culture. So you have quotes from Steve Jobs and from Arthur C. Clarke and from all these guys. So I, you know, I grew up reading Arthur C. Clarke and mm. reflecting on it, I can see how he played a role in my journey towards atheism and materialism because, mm -hmm. um, you know, that's, no doubt. that's a big part of his foundation as well. And so I don't think we need to throw, you know, the church fathers never, they also took all the goodness out of pagan, paganism. And, you know, some of the ideas in the gospel of John come from stoicism, for example, or whatever it is, right? So we can, as Christians, we're, we have the victory. And so we don't have to be afraid of these things. But I notice that for myself, and one of the things that holds me back 
is my negative perspective on my society and focusing all the times and getting caught up in YouTube videos of people who are, you know, talking about how terrible and bad things are. You know, we have wars breaking out and all these things as well. And so my that's my question to you is, is how do you maintain that sense of like, you know, I'm a part of something bigger than myself and I can be, I can write about it. I can put it out there to the world. And it doesn't even, not, you're not even writing to Orthodox Christians, but you can really feel like you're a, a positive pillar of strength for, for the society that you're living in, uh, even in the face of everything that's happening. My core philosophical view is that all truth is God's truth. And St. Paul says in Romans chapter one, that the wicked suppress the truth and unrighteousness. But fortunately for them, it will often pop up and sometimes at inconvenient moments that they're made in the image of God. While they can actively try to suppress the truth, it's gonna pop out. And I think that um, it gives us a point of contact with non-Christians. You know, when we can speak of things that are true, those things resonate in the image of God that's built into them as humans created in the image of God. And so um, I celebrate truth wherever I can find it. And I think, you know, you have a good example of St. Paul doing that at Mars Hill in the book of Acts, you know, when he, you know, he pays, um, uh, you know, he, he mentions the the tomb of this unknown God, and he uses that as sort of the starting point for preaching the gospel to them. And so I think we've we've got to acknowledge truth wherever we can find it and use it as a bridge to bring people to Christ. And then I think also like you write about gratitude, the importance of gratitude and the importance of practicing gratitude in your life in the, in the book as well. And there's some really good practices in there. And I wonder if that's also just a part of it in like this orientation of your attention towards truth and beauty and love. And so when you look at Steve Jobs, you know, you don't look at, you know, the negative things, then you, you see the goodness and you're able to build on that as well. So someone, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it's not like you're trying to gloss it over or you're not acknowledging the bad things that are there. Mm -hmm. um, but, but you have to celebrate, you know, the good. And I think gratitude is a, is a wonderful way to do that. And you mentioned earlier, Father Alexander Schmemann, and I can remember in his book for the life of the world, he said, fundamentally man is a uh, Eucharistic man. You know, the word from which we get the Eucharist means in the Greek thanksgiving. And so this is like central core to our faith. And so whenever I meet a Christian that's not thankful, that is complaining, that is negative, then they're not living out their faith. That's coming from a dark place. That's coming from a bad place. We're never more Christian than when we're being thankful and acknowledging God as active in our lives, even the difficult things. Even the people that, you know, like I think it's the most top common top topics these days is the politicians in our countries, right? That we look at them and we come, we get caught up by this media thing, and then we we find ourselves focusing. It's definitely my biggest challenge as well. Is like uh, seeing you know the leadership sometimes going in the wrong way, and then focusing very much on that and all the the darkness in the media that's that's been spoken about in there, uh, when it's completely out of my sphere of influence <laughs> to right. be able to be able to do anything about that. Yeah. Well, and I think in, the, in those situations, you know, we have to we have to recognize that um, God is still on His throne. God is still working all things together for good to those who love Him and are called according to His purpose. Romans eight twenty eight. That there that, that history is moving towards something. You know, it's not just random, and we're not just you know sort of on this sea where we're being tossed about and nobody really knows where it's going. You know, God has a plan, and I can have confidence in that. And so even in the difficult things, I can give thanks because God is still in control. God still loves me. God still is moving history forward. Okay. Well, for, um, Deacon Michael, maybe can I, can I finish up with one question? So, I mean, in, in the podcast, sure. we have a focus on masculinity and manhood and men. Um, and for me, you've definitely been a man that I've looked up to uh, and being able to learn from and emulate and 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 it's it's so necessary with these figures of men who's gone who've done stuff and gone before. What's your take on being a man today? Um, and how does one take that role? You know, and especially when I think of fatherhood, being a husband, and also being a man out in the workplace. Uh, and and what how how does one go about that in in our current you know in twenty twenty three society? I love that. I love that question. Um, 
So I've been married to my wife for 45 years. Uh, we have five grown children. We have 10 grandchildren. Uh, all 10 of my grandchildren live within five minutes of my home where I'm sitting right now. Uh, all five of my daughters live in the city where I live. So we're a very close family. I think fundamentally what it means to be a man is to take on the role of a steward, knowing that you have ultimate accountability for everything that God puts into your hands, and you will give an account for it. And so I don't, I, I think that to be a Christian man means to readily take up that responsibility and to take the initiative and act on it, to not be passive, uh, but to be active, to um, join God in his work in the world of reclaiming people, reclaiming the creation, and actively partnering with him in doing what he's about in the world. That I think, I think more than anything, that whole idea of stewardship and initiative and responsibility and accountability, that's what it means to be a man. That sounds like a very good approach. Um, I'll just add that if you need some more structure and support in exactly doing that in practice, then go get your best year yet, uh, the new edition coming out. Uh, is it already released, the latest edition? Yes. Actually, yeah. the title, yeah. when people search for it, it's Your Best Year Ever. Your Best Year Ever, sorry. Your, that's okay. Your Best Year Ever. And uh, at at the time of the recording, we're recording this, we're about a month away from the release. So it will be out in early November, and you'll be able to find it wherever, as I say, wherever better books are sold. <laughs> Great, yes. And also a host of other books uh, uh, that I found incredibly useful. I can definitely highlight uh, the one on the visionary leader and then uh, free to focus uh, have been incredibly useful and helpful for Thank me. you so as much, a, Paul. As a business owner and Christian man, finding my way with family, uh, free time, and trying to become a good steward for, for, for what it is that we're doing. So. Yeah, thank you. Thank you much. so much. I appreciate it.